1979, when I got to Chicago, Friedman had already moved to California. But he would occasionally come back to visit the Hyde Park campus. And on one of those occasions, I saw him and rushed up and shook his hand, knowing full well that that might be one of the few interesting achievements of my life. <laughs> the Friedman that we read and study tends to be the ultimate descendant of the Scottish empiricists. And that's something that Friedman himself has mentioned on occasion. The important thing about both Adam Smith and David Hume was that they were not interested like the continental philosophers who were normative and idealistic in trying to tell people how they should live or how they ideally could live, but rather with dealing with how they actually lived and then trying to understand. In fact, Hume went on to even make the point that people already make up their minds and then invent theories to suit the actions that they anyway uh, intend to undertake. This tradition of empiricism has been an old one in, in um, Frank Knight, has been an old one in Chicago. And all of us are acquainted, or at least in passing acquainted, <coughs> with the classic monetary history of the United States, which is an empirical Bible to look back and see, in fact, what is it that money, the demand for money and the supply of money does to the real macroeconomy. But the Friedman who emerged in the late 70s, particularly with his television series, was a different Friedman. He was now on a passionate crusade to make the point that we are condemning ourselves and our children to a bad outcome by making wrong choices. The best of the writing of the Austrian school was not based on this. It was based on essentialist logic, not on consequential logic. A thing was good or bad, and for Hayek or von Mises, as the young lady mentioned, the opening freedom was an end in itself, and therefore a policy against freedom was fundamentally immoral and unacceptable. I think it is the intelligence of this man that he figured that that's not going to work. That might be very well true, and all of us here in this room may actually believe that freedom is a moral imperative, and any compromises we make with freedom are unacceptable. Any acceptance of a totalitarian state or a sovereign who is a tyrant is unacceptable. That might be our positions individually, but this is not going to sell. And I think he figured out that what is going to sell is consequential logic. There's a focus on the outcomes as comes out quite dramatically in the TV series and in the, in the little excerpt that we just saw. And the point he was trying to make is, all right, I don't have much of a difference of opinion with you people, those who believe in state planning or believe in so-called welfare socialism. We all agree that poverty should go. We all agree that our children need better education. Now I will proceed to demonstrate to you that the policies that you are pushing, in fact, are not going to achieve those outcomes that we all agree on, and in fact are going to achieve the opposite outcomes. And to my mind, this is a major, single major intellectual reason that Friedman moved away from being merely a great monetary historian to becoming an important icon for all of us. Because we stopped having those arguments with our socialist, well, for lack of another word, I'll call them friends, with our socialist friends 
about what is good or desirable. We said, okay, let's concede up front that we are on the same page about what's good or desirable. But let me now show you that what you are proposing to do, when you are saying that a few people, few commissars of the Ghost Clan sitting in Kremlin can in fact improve the welfare of the entire Soviet people, that is not true. The market is a better way to improve the welfare of the Soviet of the entire Soviet people, and that is the argument we will make, and that was such a winning argument that Friedman simply swept them away. Even a, a, a person who was as wishy-washy as Amartya Sen basically has conceded that yes, you know, school teachers who are unionized don't come to work. And in fact, they don't come, more of them don't come to work in poorer neighborhoods. So in fact, poorer kids get no education, rather than richer kids. So these are empirical facts. Go back to Scottish empiricism and say, hey, we're not talking about, you know, freedom as a, as a positive model. Take that, we will talk when we are among ourselves, libertarians. But when we are talking to you, to the great unwashed, we will talk about what we agree upon, we will talk about outcomes, and we will demonstrate to you empirically taking the facts on the ground, that the proposals you make, subsidizing AMLO, or creating large steel plants, or creating, giving licenses to Birla and uh, Valjant to set up obsolete uh, automobile plants, these, in fact, these policies are going to impoverish your own people, and are successfully doing that. That is, is the single biggest achievement which made the Reagan-Thatcher revolutions possible, which made Narasimharao liberalization in India possible, is the intellectual groundwork that the free-to-choose approach. Free-to-choose is a very tantalizing uh, name for a serial, right? I mean, and it came on PBS and so many other things every evening or once a week. And, but the entire approach was that if you choose certain courses, you are going to hurt yourself, you are going to not achieve the objectives that you yourself want to achieve. At one stroke, the entire basis of central planning started getting questioned because the whole basis of the Maldonadus model was that we know best and we will make you less poor. If you look at the 1951-1956 plan documents, by 1976 India should have made up an economic property. We should have been a middle income country. In fact, Korea and us have the same GDP per capita GDP as recently as 1958-60. Look where they are now. They are an OECD country, they are a rich country. And we still have 100 billion people going to bed every night hungry. So in fact, I have argued and those of you who haven't bought my book should buy my book. I deserve some royalties. <laughs> That's an aside. I have argued that the Planning Commission of India, its primary goal has been to keep India a poor country. And since they have achieved that goal so magnificently, it's high time they dissolve themselves. Uh, and I think Friedman's love affair with India is really about this whole issue. As Louis said he first came in the 50s. And I never knew. When I was in Chicago, I, I had no idea that Friedman had ever visited India. I found out years later, thanks to the internet. On the internet, all these things float around, and somebody sent me about 15 years ago, um, or 18 years ago, the, the uh, excerpts of Friedman's writings on India. And uh, fascinating. Um, in those days, as you know, unfortunately these days too, this country was dominated by the so-called intellectuals of Delhi, and the Delhi School of Economics had a disproportionate influence. The only economist with the backbone of the country, B.R. Shinoy, who disagreed with the second plan, was shunted out. He was called a Bombay School fellow, and we Bombay School people. We were kicked out, and Shanoi was kicked out. 
And of course, the second plan proceeded to create more injustice, more horrors for the Indian population, all because we wanted to build uh, you know, steel plants which were uneconomic. Friedman met Shinoy and actually recorded I mean, I was quite surprised to see that he actually recorded that this man knows what he's talking about. That we did have, we did have intellectual dissent in India in the 50s. The idea that everybody subscribed to this uh, Nairobian gigantism and the Stalinist planning commission ideas is not true. There was dissent. The dissent was squashed. It was squashed because people like us who sit in this room didn't make enough noise. And I, I think one of the important things that Friedman has told us is it's not sufficient to write great economic uh, literature. It's not sufficient to prove Pareto optimality in some ideal conditions. It is important to take the message into the public hustings. It is important to communicate. It is important to get the idea. Here was this campaign in 1971. Frank, frankly, which I supported. I supported the Communist Party in the 1971 campaign for Garibi Hatta. So, assuming in 71 that party won the elections, poverty should have been eliminated in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. The promise was it would be eliminated in 5 years. None of that has happened. And we lose if we remain silent. And I think that's why it's important that CCS is conducting this event, that we pay our tribute to Milton, we re-energize ourselves in the area of public debate and discussion. The other person who Friedman was very positive about was C. Rajagopalachari, the founder of the Swatantra Party and probably the most far-sighted public figure we have had in the history of independent India. It was Rajaji who coined the expression permit license Raj. And as many have said, no tyrant British Raj did as much harm to the Indian economy as our own self-imposed permit license Raj. Before Narasimha Rao gave us the limited freedoms that we have today, we had to wait three years to buy a scooter. We had to wait ten years to get a landline. Today, 900 billion cell phones are in India. Today, scooter and motorbike companies are falling all over themselves to sell their products to you. The change that has happened because of the very limited freedom that Narasimha Rao gave us is enormous. And yet, we are not talking about this enough. We are not making this point in the public domain. In, 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 in the way we participate in public discourse, we are not following what Friedman so eloquently taught us in the second half of his career. I would submit that you know, India was a very interesting and eclectic country in the 50s and 60s. Any economist in any American or British university could get himself an invitation to Delhi. Anonymous was willing to meet anybody as long as he was a foreigner. And he met them, and it was our tragedy that he listened to Caldor and Lange, Cobb, Douglas, Function, all these people who actually believed, you know, in, in put out the tables that you could, sitting in Delhi, you could model this vast country and dictate to people exactly how they would produce, you know, so many tons of steel would convert into so many tons of locomotives which would convert into so many tons. All physical planning. In fact, Malanabas gave a long speech on the importance of physical planning. Never understood price, never understood signaling, never understood that they were rational economic rational or otherwise, they were economic agents who could nullify what you were doing. All the stuff that, frankly, everybody knew if he, if he only wanted to know. So the worst experiments with these new models, Cobb, Douglas, and Lange, and this and that, and I think the last model, the third five-year plan model, had something like several thousand variables and 850 constraints or something. Some extraordinarily huge model was used. We didn't even have the computing power in India. So, of course, we had a lot of people like that movie shows that kept on adding and subtracting and multiplying to 
complete the circle and walk, which of course went nowhere. Not a single goal has been met. In fact, our power level, electricity production levels, you go by our plan documents, should be 300% higher 20 years ago. I mean, where are we? We are 300% lower 20 years later. So all these physical targets, everyone has failed. The promise of eliminating poverty has failed. The limited freedom we've had has in fact produced spectacular results. And yet, we continue to remain on the defensive. Whenever people talk about inclusive growth, they're basically saying it's not growth. Whenever they talk about the great crisis of modern capitalism and how India should avoid it, what they mean to say is let's not take any risk. If you take risks, you will have crises. But if you take risks, you will also grow. If you take no risks, you can be a static society. No growth, there will be no crises. With zero volatility, you can also have zero growth. But if you need high growth, there will be volatile times. Societies will have to take risks. We don't want to talk about these things. We don't want to say them as they are. And for CCS, I think this is the most important thing that we need to bring. And I know you're doing a sterling job. But all of us need to bring this uh, as our tribute to Milton, to Stiegler, to Chennai, to our own homegrown defender of the faith. To so many people, Masani, Ratnaswamy, um, Ratagopalachari, and what's more than and what we, we lost. And I, I, I particularly feel bitter about it. In this room, at least three or four classmates of mine, we graduated in 73 from business school. 73 was the year the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act was introduced. <coughs> four years later, IBM and Coca Cola were kicked out. And we spent 20 years in the wilderness. The best part of our lives, we had to work to get 18 approvals to start a factory in Delhi, apart from the approvals at state and, and district levels. And you know, the whole of your life, you're not starting factories, but you're running around for paperwork. It's a waste of life. So, we did. And in 1973, we were not that far from Korea. We could have made it. So, it's a lost generation for us in the sense of how much we left on the table, how much we didn't make. And unfortunately, the good things that happened for the ten, first 10 years after 1991 seem to be now reversing, and we seem to be going back. This um, red heading, this completely fatuous proposition of inclusive growth is now being used growth. And when there is no growth, it's neither inclusive nor exclusive. It's just poverty. That's what it is. And we are fast heading. The numbers look bad. We probably will go sub-5% growth very shortly. And a lot of it is a return of status quotas, status approval principles, and planning. Delhi knows best. Ministry of Environmental Affairs knows best. Ministry of Commerce knows best. One day, you suddenly tell cotton farmers you cannot export Two days later, you say, okay, you can't export. I mean, give me a break. Who in Delhi has the right to tell cotton farmers what to do? I mean, apart from being completely egregiously immoral, it's so bad. Anyway, let me end with the thing that it is important that as we pay homage to an extraordinary figure. By the way, I don't know how many of you know, to the extent, many of you probably read all on Wikipedia, there are many achievements from Milton which has nothing to do with monetary policy or monetary history. He was the guy who persuaded the U.S. government to do with only taxes. He thought that it was a smart fiscal maneuver to actually improve Uncle Sam's finances. He was the guy who worked tirelessly for a voluntary army and replacement of the draft. So there's many things. But I think from our perspective in India, and particularly in India today, there is one sense of loss, that in the 50s when we came here, we didn't listen to him. We listen to the wrong set of economists. And he points that out very clearly. In 1868, when Japan opened up, the prevailing philosophy in Britain was laissez-faire. And they adopted that. In 1948, 
Hattie was nationalizing coal, steel, everything, creating the NHS in England, so we imitated the England at that time. Of course, in India, where we tend to imitate, we imitate in excess and make them grotesque caricatures. Britain has moved on, but we've got a bureaucracy far worse than what the British gave us. So we have this uh, national ability to indulge in grotesque caricature. But that's, that's a separate issue altogether. Uh, I think it is important for us to have the sense of loss. The Friedman and his ideas did not predict the 50s. And the sense that we must start arguing about our outcomes. Among the converted, it is perfectly okay to argue <coughs> freedom is a fundamental end and a means and we will not compromise either with a Hitler or a Stalin. That is fine. But when we are dealing with those who have deluded themselves that state intervention is a solution, I don't think we should use that argument. We should come back to Milton's argument about outcomes. Get the argument away from what we all agree as objectives and then prove to them that the very objectives that they seek to meet will get sabotage with the means that they are pursuing. And we need to do this loudly, clearly, emphatically in the public domain in India. Otherwise, trust me, we will remain a poor country for another 50 years, which means for many of us in this room, in our lifetimes, we will not see the end of poverty. And that is not a prospect that I think any of us wants to subscribe to or agree to. With those words, thanks so much.